ask yourself, if there was one truth about the Christian faith you simply couldn't live without, what would it be? In other words, what truth for Christians is so important and so essential that without it, the rest of our faith would be put in jeopardy? Well, as far as the early church was concerned, perhaps one of the most dominant themes was that of Christology. Now, you might be wondering, why Christology? Why not, for example, salvation or the gospel? But ask yourself, what do we mean when we say the gospel? And what do we mean when we say salvation? Now, allow me to ask you two more questions related to these. What is our gospel? That is, about whom are we speaking? And what is our salvation? Well, the answer to both of these questions is really one and the same. Christ Jesus. It is Christ Jesus about whom the gospel speaks, and it is Christ Jesus who is our salvation. That is, Christology is essentially defined as the study of the person of Jesus Christ. And therefore, Christology plays a foundational role for the rest of Christian theology. And really, one way to think of Christology in relation to the rest of Christian theology and Christian living as a whole would be similar to how reading, writing, and arithmetic are foundational to education. So, for example, in preschool, two of the first things we learn are how to count and the alphabet. Because if you can't count, then you can't do basic calculations. And if you can't do basic calculations, then how in the world are you going to be able to do some of the higher maths, such as algebra, geometry, or even calculus for that matter? Not to mention some of the more practical applications of these skills aside. And similarly, if you don't know the alphabet, how will you ever be able to read or write? And if you can't read or write, how do you ever expect to read classical literature, give a speech, create a document for your company, to name just a few of the possibilities and applications of these skills? Likewise, Christology plays a foundational role for the rest of Christian theology. Therefore, how you understand Christology shapes how you understand the rest of Christian theology. And in the same way that algebra incorporates multiplication into itself, so do do other areas of Christian theology incorporate Christology. Because if you don't know how to multiply correctly or use your times tables, then algebra will yield some very strange results, to say the least. And for example, let's just take soteriology. It's the study of salvation. How you understand Christology will shape how you do soteriology. That is, if you don't understand who Jesus is, then you won't adequately understand how he affects us in the salvific sense. And just to show how foundational Christology is, let's just take the reformers of the Reformation of the 16th century like Luther or Calvin. Now, while the focus of the Reformation primarily centered around topics relating to soteriology, the Reformers nevertheless considered topics like Christology and how Jesus related to the Father and Spirit to be more important, more central, and more foundational than, for example, grace by faith alone. And so it is for this very reason that we are going to be focusing on the topic of Christology in this series of videos. I think perhaps the best definition of Christology can be summed up in the following question. Who is Jesus? How you answer that question will ultimately determine the rest of your theology. So when we talk about Christology, we're going to be primarily focusing on answering this very question. However, while the question itself may seem quite simple, it is in answering it that we come to unveil a whole series of additional questions which are not simple. And these questions 
lead us to more questions that are even more complex than the previous ones, which leads us to more complex questions, and so on and so forth. Well, to be more specific, in order to get an adequate understanding of who Jesus is, requires that we answer two additional questions. The first question, and perhaps the question that will predominate in our discussion, involves the nature of Jesus. That is, what is Jesus? Now, like any other person, part of talking about who Jesus is involves discussing what Jesus is. That is, his nature. Now, understandably, many may get a bit bent out of shape labeling Jesus a what. But unfortunately, it's just a fact that we have to, we, we just can't get around and have to just accept. Because part of who we are is determined by what we are. And just to get an idea of what I'm talking about here, let's just take the topics of ethnicity and gender. Now, obviously, this is quite a controversial topic. But regardless of what your views are on the matter, the fact remains what we are plays a large role in determining who we are. The same is true about the person of Christ. Because the problems that we're going to be looking at that dominated the early church scene are predominantly with regards to how you answer the simple question, what is Jesus? Because how you answer this question will ultimately determine how you understand who he is. So then, what was Jesus? That is, what was his nature? Well, various answers can be given to this question, ranging from human, divine, angelic, canine, feline, dragonine. The list is literally endless. In other words, there are literally a million and one possible answers to this question. But if we're using the Bible as our source of information, then our list becomes drastically reduced from one million and one to two. That is, on the one hand, the Gospels present to us a Jesus who was very much human in every way, in that he experienced life in the same way, in that he was born and he died like any other human. Likewise, he bore needs like any human, in that he experienced hunger, thirst, fatigue, suffering, in that he experienced emotions like humans, that he had joy, that he experienced anger, stress, grief, and loneliness, just to give a few examples. And finally, he performed various actions like a human being. He ate, drank, slept, and wept really much like any other person, human being. On the other hand, Scripture also presents to us a Jesus who was divine in every way. We see this clearly manifest in such things as his virgin birth, resurrection from the dead, as well as in many of the claims that Jesus made about himself concerning his relationship with God the Father. So, as we discuss the nature of Jesus, we're going to be doing so in reference to these two. Now, one would think that being that we are only dealing with two natures, the question should be fairly easy to address. The problem is, that these two particular natures bear characteristics that don't naturally gel together. Now, taken by themselves, everything seems okay. It's when they are taken together that the problems arise. So, just to get an idea of what I'm talking about here, well, I'm going to put the general characteristics of humanity in one column and the characteristics of divinity alongside it. For example, when we speak about divinity, at least in the monotheistic sense, we're talking about a being who is, above all, eternal, immortal, omniscient, and omnipotent, just to name a few. However, when we speak about humanity, we're talking about a being who has a beginning, comes to an end, and is limited both physically and mentally. But then imagine trying to put these two together. In other words, 
the eternal God was born. The immortal God died. The omniscient God did not know. The omnipotent God became tired. As you can probably see here, just by matter of definition, there is a natural conflict or dissonance between the natures. And it's because of this dissonance, one can probably imagine some of the potential problems this could create. And so many of the conflicts that we are going to be examining revolve around this very issue. Now, there are literally dozens, if not potentially hundreds, of possible theologies that can result from this conflict of natures. And therefore, due to this large number, one can quickly get lost in a sea of theologies with absolutely no frame of reference with which to orient oneself. And therefore, in order to help us understand both the orthodox position as well as each of these ideas, I've designed a chart to help put things in context. That is, bring a little bit of stability amidst all the anarchy. Okay, now don't freak out. I promise we are going to walk through these one by one. Uh, and it must be noted that this list is far from exhaustive. In fact, most if not all of these views each could be further subdivided into more specific categories. But this at least gives us enough of an idea. Now, looking at this chart, you'll notice that I've divided all theological positions into one of two general camps, Christ's divinity and Christ's humanity. And the reason for this is simply because throughout church history, most, if not all, theological positions have tended to lean more towards one of the two extremes. That is, they will either lean more in favor of Christ's humanity at the expense of his divinity, or they will lean more towards his divinity at the expense of his humanity. So much so that even many Orthodox Christians today unknowingly will lean more in favor of one over the other. And it's not so much that they are either one or the other, so much as somewhere along a spectrum, as I have shown here. And the reason for this is simply due to this natural conflict and dissonance between the two natures. And therefore, finding the proper balance between these two can be a bit of a balancing act, to say the least. And similar to how balancing weights on a scale can require great amounts of precision, so too will the early church be required to make painstaking measures to ensure the balance between these two natures of Jesus. Now, if you look closely at the dates here, you'll notice that they seem to move along almost, I guess you would say, in a parallel fashion towards the center. That is, the further along we move in time, the closer we move towards the center of the chart. That is what we call orthodoxy. Whereas the further we move back in time, in history, the more polarized and extreme the heresies are. But what is even more interesting, though, is how this progression happens. Now, as you may have noticed, the progression of heresies seems to resemble the motion of a pendulum swing that starts off really high, but as it swings back and forth, it loses energy as its strokes become less and less until it comes to settle in the middle. And this is simply because with the passage of time, the church is going to refine, that is, bring more clarity to its doctrine in response to bad theology. And so as we examine each of the Christological heresies, we're going to be doing so in the following sequence. The second question we're going to be discussing is, who is Jesus in relationship to God? Now, when we talk about who Jesus is, it is very difficult to do so divorced from his relationship to the rest of the Godhead. Because when we speak of Jesus, we speak of him as Christ the Son. However, to speak of the Son, like any son, implies a father. And likewise, a father, a son. Because who Jesus is, 
is only fully understood within the relational dynamic he shares with the Father and Spirit. Now, there were really three basic truths that had been assumed by the early church back from its inception. God is one, Christ is divine, and God the Father and Christ the Son are distinct from one another. That is, the Father is not the Son, and likewise the Son is not the Father. Now, it doesn't take much to see how problems and conflicts could potentially emerge in upholding all three of these beliefs simultaneously. And so perhaps one of the biggest problems the church is going to face is reconciling the oneness of God on the one hand with the distinction of persons on the other. And so as a result, various theological positions are going to emerge with respect to this relationship. And again, we are going to go into more depth with regards to each of these positions in detail in the following videos. Additionally, we shall be discussing who Jesus is, not only in relationship to God alone, but also in his relationship to humanity. For it is important not only understanding from whom salvation comes, but also to whom it is offered. So in summary, we've mentioned thus far that Christology is the study of the person of Jesus Christ, and that such a topic serves a foundational role for the rest of Christian theology, as well as the Christian faith as a whole. However, part of understanding who Jesus is involves understanding what his nature is and who he is in relationship to both God and man. Now, it must be noted that the examples we will be discussing by no means exhaust the topic of Christology. Rather, the examples we will be focusing on describe some of the biggest challenges early Christians faced and how they would respond to them. For the early church, as well as for many Orthodox Christians throughout the ages, Christology is not merely another branch amongst all the branches of Christian theology. It is, in fact, the very linchpin that holds together the Christian faith. As one theologian best expressed it, the center of Christianity is not an idea, system, or thing. It is not even the gospel as such. It is Jesus Christ. I invite all questions and comments in the discussion section, so please feel free to write or ask any questions below. Thanks.